kid or us, we are going to head into the next plenary, which is looking at green finance and the challenge of balancing sustainability, sustainable finance and financial stability. I'd like to invite the speakers up on stage. Mr. Akim Daouda, who is the CEO of the Gabonese Sovereign Wealth Fund. Feel free to give him a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, any way you want. <laughs> Feel free. Chris Hayward, who is chair of the Policy Committee of the City of London. Diana Layfield, the Chair of British International Investment. <laughs> Diane Karusisi, who is the CEO of Bank of Kigali. <laughs> and James Harris, who is Honorary Consul for Vanuatu to the United Kingdom. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. For, uh, for joining me on stage. Green finance is the topic. A uh, lot to be said about it, quite a pertinent topic. We've just come out of the um, UN Climate Change Summit in, in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, COP27. Uh, for those of you who, who aren't aware, that ended with a bit of a landmark agreement on setting up a loss and damage fund, um, which is to, dedicated to or aimed at supporting the global south in uh, tackling the challenge of climate change. Now, that of course is part of a bigger picture around green finance and sustainable finance globally, which is uh, becoming increasingly important and in the context of how the extent to which climate change is affecting many regions in the global south, particularly regions like sub-Saharan Africa, historically the world's lowest emitter, but in many ways, the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. It is of, it has never been more important to drive green finance, green investment, and sustainable investment. Now, we want to, what we want to do with this session, we have 60 minutes, is to kind of get a bit of a sense of where we are. Um, the estimate is that in order to transition to a low carbon growth model, globally we need four to six trillion dollars a year. Uh, with countries in the global south needing at least a trillion dollars a year for climate action. Now, I know we live in an age of inflation, but that's still a lot of money. Uh, so how, how do we make that happen? Where is it going to come from? And uh, importantly, you know, what is the state of sustainable finance, of green finance, and how do we look forward and move forward. Now, in terms of the, the, the proceedings, um, what we will do is we will have a, a quick introductory round here where I will, I'll throw a general question at each of the speakers and I'll give them two or three minutes to sort of give us their quick take on that question, but also what would be good to start setting the scene here is uh, to use that time to also maybe give us a bit of context on your work uh, how it relates to the topic of green finance and sustainable finance, and some of your key themes that um, really should, should, this conversation should be centered uh, around. Now, Akim, you have the misfortune of sitting next to me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. Now, the, 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 the general question is the same for all of you. You can spend as little or as much time on it as you want. Uh, no, no obligation, but it's, it's, I think it's a good way to, to kick things off. And it goes as follows. Are current levels of green finance, as well as the nature of instruments available, adequate to secure adaptation and mitigation strategies or deal with the ongoing climate change facing developing countries? So we can split that into two. You don't have to comment on the climate change, but I think it would be good to get your quick take on where are we? Is it adequate? Do we need more? How do we get more? Akim. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say that uh, we're really pleased to be here as a new commerce in the Commonwealth family uh, coming from Gabon. And um, I'll, I'll present it from the Gabonese perspective and from the Congo Basin perspective. Um, when you look at um, uh, the carbon sinks in the world, the Congo Basin is the largest one. Uh, especially uh, with the Amazon being a net emitter today. 
And when you uh, consider that, you realize that everything that we're doing in terms of um, carbon capture technology, uh, energy transition, uh, and all sort of um, new solution in terms of um, uh, reducing emission, if we don't ensure that we maintain carbon sink, carbon sinks, uh, everything else that we're doing is irrelevant. That being said, uh, Gabon has been doing a fantastic job since uh, 30 years that uh, we committed to the stewardship of the nature. And um, for the past three to five years, uh, we've worked intensively in creating a solution from Gabon to the world, which are the 90 million carbon credits, sovereign carbon credit that we're bringing on the market. And we believe that this is, will be a critical tool in that fight against climate change. Thank you very much, Akim. And Gabon is indeed positioning itself as a bit of a leader uh, in, on the African continent in terms of... Pioneer. Yeah, a pioneer, yeah, even better, uh, when it comes to uh, yeah, basically harnessing the environment right, for, uh, to drive sustainability and sustainable investing. And uh, my understanding is that Africa is actually a net carbon sink for the world. It actually absorbs more carbon than it puts out. Anyway. Um, Chris, we've heard already about the City of London. Everyone knows about the importance of the City of London, one of the world's most important financial centers. Give us your take on the state of green finance and sustainable finance. So green finance, we think, is uh, a perfect tool for actually driving this agenda. It's incredibly important. And we, we believe the City of London is a, a leader where, when it comes to green green finance, and I, I myself sit on something called the, the Green Finance Institute, which is promoting green finance here in the city of London. I mean, the bottom line for me is that if we're to tackle decarbonisation in the global south, we have to transfer monies from the global north to the global south. It's very simplistic, really, but capital flows are absolutely essential. Uh, and I think that, that the challenge is, as well, ensuring that there, there are properly defined infrastructure projects, etc., in the emerging markets, which, which can be funded by, by these sorts of monies. And there has been some reticence from investors to do this, it, it's fair to say, but there are some good examples of things that are really positive. So, for example, an organization called CLFI has sprung up, Climate Leadership Finance Initiative, which initially has been formed in India. And, and I went out there just a couple of months ago to their meeting. And this is about actually getting ready, bankable, green finance projects, which can actually be funded uh, in, in India. And that model can actually, in my view, be rolled out across all our emerging markets. Because what we know today is that public finance cannot tackle this job alone. It's just too massive. We need, we need private finance. We had commitments to private finance from G fans uh, in Glasgow, and we now need to ensure those capital flows are actually going out there into the market. My job as the policy chairman of the City of London is to be the political leader of, of the corporation and to speak for financial and professional services sector, particularly the private sector, to government both in this country and, and globally as well. On this is one of my key priority areas uh, to tackle. Thank, thank you very much, Chris. A um, couple of, of takeaways for me there. One, capital transfers are absolutely essential. But I think, and it's implicit in what you're saying, we're not talking about charity here. We're talking about uh, investment. And uh, bankable projects are key to that. No doubt we will pick up on some of those themes. Uh, Diana, British International Investment, uh, the UK's DFI, Development Finance Institution, big investor in uh, developing economies, emerging economies, um, and given the dimming global outlook, in many ways the role of DFIs is becoming more important to addressing the challenge of green finance, sustainable finance. Uh, give us your, t your quick take on the state of things and some of the areas that you would point to as priorities. I think the short answer to your adequacy question is it's not adequate. Um, you called out some pretty substantial annual numbers. Uh, I think the aggregated gap for emerging economies to make those climate finance targets uh, is an additional $95 trillion, uh, which is obviously more than global GDP. So there's quite a substantial uh, gap to be closed there. Um, it's even more acute uh, 
as you look at those emerging economies. So um, only 3% of global climate finance uh, went to Africa, sub-Saharan Africa in 2020, uh, and only 4.7% to South Asia. So some of the areas with either the largest need and or the largest uh, carbon challenges uh, are seeing really significant gaps in funding. Um, as you said, uh, BII is the UK's DFI, uh, and as a result, we are the largest investor in climate finance for the UK government uh, around the world, and particularly in Commonwealth countries. Uh, it's not all climate finance, but about $6 billion, 70% of our portfolio is in Commonwealth countries. And in 2022, so just this year, uh, we invested $500 million in climate finance uh, in Africa and South Asia. So it's a huge priority for us. Um, all of our investments are, are Paris aligned uh, independently of whether they're in uh, climate finance specifically. Uh, and we're looking to invest 30% uh, each year in climate finance. So um, very substantial priorities. I think net zero is a huge challenge. I think an even bigger challenge uh, is this concept of transition. So resilient uh, economies creating resilience and transition through investment. And perhaps we can talk a bit more about that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but uh, just, just to reiterate that figure, 95 trillion is, is the funding gap. Um, so yeah, not adequate, I think, is putting it mildly. Um, but uh, let's see if we can come up with some ideas about how to maybe at least reduce that gap. Uh, Diane, over to you. Um, give us a perspective from uh, Rwanda and Bank of Kigali. Thank you, and thank you for having me today. Um, I think everyone has said it, uh, the gap is huge, $95 trillion. I think we do very well in terms of measuring the gaps, but also talking about the damages uh, caused by uh, uh, climate change. But are we doing enough? I don't think we're doing enough. We are very good at speaking and, you know, presenting, uh, but we're not doing enough. When it comes to Africa, I think uh, Africa is probably the most vulnerable when it comes to um, uh, food insecurity caused by climate change. And the, the reason is simple. 90% uh, of Africa food systems are ra rain fed. So we don't have rain, we don't have food. It's as simple as that. And uh, you know, I think that the, the minister from Kenya uh, earlier today was pointing to this, uh, the worst drought in 40 years. Probably many people here have seen the tragic images of uh, wildlife losses, death uh, in the region. So yes, the damages are there. Uh, the people are there, the experts are there, but let's start doing it. And uh, when you think about my country in particular, Rwanda, first of all, uh, agriculture receives the less funding from banking. Only 6% of bank financing goes to agriculture. And as I said earlier, 95% of our food is rain fed. So there's a double challenge there, finding uh, funding for agriculture and also financing resilience uh, to have resilient food systems. So we have massive challenges and we need to start talking about practical um, approaches on how to finance uh, and to close the gaps. Thank you. Okay, we will come back to that because I, I, I feel like you've got an answer ready to go on, well, what do we actually do? And uh, I'm very, very curious to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, James, you have the advantage of having listened to everyone else, so you can cherry pick what you'd like to comment on. So um, for, I'll give the, obviously, the Vanuatu perspective. Um, everybody is impacted by climate change one way or another. Um, I think what we're trying to do is to, um, although we're very proactive, uh, and in fact, through the climate change ag agenda, Vanuatu has found its moment on the international stage. Uh, we are currently running um, an initiative to drive a resolution through the uh, UN General Assembly. We're seeking um, a referral to the International Court of Justice um, for an, just an advisory opinion on various aspects of, of climate change. It's not a blame game, it's not apportioning blame. It's just trying to establish the facts that climate change exists, um, that, that countries have made commitments to address climate change, and acknowledgement that those commitments are not currently being met. Um, and, and so we need to do more about it. And I think that's the extent of the opinion we're, we're seeking. Um, as far as what that means for Vanuatu itself, um, it, it does open up an opportunity for us on the back of all that uh, exposure that we've had to present ourselves as 
less of a victim of climate change and more as a partner. And we want to, um, we, we, like everybody has recognized here, there's not enough public finance available, so we have to go after private sector finance. And I was sitting down last, um, last week with our new uh, Minister of Finance, uh, on, Honourable uh, Ralph Reagan-Vanu, um, and he, we had this discussion, and he asked me specifically to go after private sector finance. Um, you know, being based here in, in London, one of the major financial centres of the world, I have a, a very good opportunity to do that. There are considerations on how to pre present and project Vanuatu as a potential destination of, of choice, you might say, for, for sustainable finance. Um, um, and that is a matter of, of communication and packaging. But I think with Vanuatu being a, a, you know, a relatively small um, country, peaceful, non-aligned, um, tax-free, I think we can package ourselves quite well for the international market as long as we can find projects of sufficient scale to attract um, international investment. Um, so I'm, I'm actually in discussions now with some um, investment banks here in London um, about how to generate and how to structure investment for Vanuatu. And I think one of the important things for us to bear in mind is that given our, our, our distance geographically um, from the rest of the world, um, you know, there is a matter of um, image and, and um, considerations of, of risk. You know, how, how do we present ourselves as a, as a relatively low-risk destination? And I think you know, the couple of points there are that um, a little money goes a long way in a country like Vanuatu and, and can yield very visible results. And I think that can be quite attractive to people, whether it's a financial return or just a result um, presentationally. Um, on, on, on their investment. So I think that's, that's um, a, a key consideration for us. And I think the more that we can control um, and maintain the finance from a recognized financial center like London, and then, then bring that finance to bear in, into Vanuatu, then the more chance we've got of, of raising um, capital here um, and having it administered professionally and, and giving people confidence um, that, 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 that the risk is, is uh, minimized. So those are a few thoughts. I, I like the point you make around positioning Vanuatu not just as a victim of climate change, but as a partner in climate action. It resonates very strongly uh, with, um, in the African context as well, because uh, a lot of the narrative is around victimhood, which is, how shall we say, perhaps not the most useful way of approaching the problem. Now, let's, um, let's try to Let's try to look forward here a little bit. Um, we've established that financing is inadequate. There's obviously a hef heavy, hefty to-do list to scale up and to bring in the private sector. That's a key priority because public funding, uh, especially in the current context, is, not, is simply not going to get the job done. Um, before I sort of open that up for, for everyone, um, Akim, I'd like to turn back to you because on the, on the topic of, well, what do you do, right? Uh, Gabon's, Gabon's kind of an interesting case because um, you, the, hang on, I've got my notes here, yeah. So you've, Gabon's launched a sovereign, uh, sovereign carbon credits, right? Now, I'm a layman, okay? So when I hear carbon credits, I don't really know what that means. Give us a bit of an idea of um, what that means and why that is relevant to the conversation we're having here. Thank you, and let me reassure you, many people don't understand even <laughs> so that. So if someone tells you they know about carbon credit, you should run away. <laughs> um, the reality is, as I mentioned, Gabon has been uh, involved or engaged in the stewardship of the nature even before it was front page, uh, f f front page news. Uh, we didn't even knew at the t we didn't even know at the time that uh, this is something that we could monetize, but we did know that uh, it was the right thing to do. Now the reality is uh, we decided not to make a choice between uh, developing our economy, catering to the needs of our people, or preserving the nature, but this comes at a cost. Uh, this cost, we've been uh, bearing it so far, and we've been rendering this service to the planet. Gabon today is 83% of the country that is covered by forest. Uh, so it's a forest that is being sustainably exploited, managed, 
Uh, we make sure that we only cut one tree every hectare, so we're not doing intensive uh, timber uh, exploitation. And basically, we took a, a series of groundbreaking policy in the management of our forest. Uh, just to name a few, uh, we've, um, we have uh, established a network of national parks which cover 12% of the country's landmass. And back in 2010, we banned the export of raw logs in Gabon, which mechanically uh, negatively impacted our fiscal revenues, which were reduced by, let's say, more than 20 to 30%. And knowingly that uh, before we discovered oil, timber was our largest uh, income earner and uh, GDP contributor. And uh, we faced a lot of resistance from the operators as well. But uh, the, the government was, um, how do you say, an, apolog an apologetic about it. Now, 10 years down the road, uh, we move into uh, timber processing, first and second transformation. Uh, the value creation is in Gabon. Before that time, 90% of the log was exported with the value of a C. Now today, we have 60 to 70 percent of the value that is in Gabon. We have, upscale, we have upgraded the skills of our workers and at the same time improved their livelihood. And by doing that also, we were able to um, reduce our emissions. So basically, the carbon credit that we created are the reduction in emission from 2010 when this law was taken to 2018. So that created, in terms of absorption, uh, a total of 180 million uh, tons of carbon credits, of which we have uh, 97 million tons of red plus certified UNF C carbon credits. And this echo back to what my co-panelists were mentioning, were mentioning, we're not asking for subsidies, handouts, or grants. Here, what we're saying is, we have created that financial instrument now we want the world to price it at a fair and just price, which will allow us to continue maintaining this stewardship uh, of the forest for, for the rest of the world. Yeah, thank you, Akim. And uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the the, the carbon, carbon credit market is becoming more relevant uh, to Africa. And uh, as you said earlier, Gabon's a bit of a pioneer. Uh, my understanding is that during COP27, um, there was a big initiative launched as well yep. to scale up. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So one to keep an eye on. Um, Chris and Diane, I'd um, like to, to, to turn to you now. And uh, Dan, I, I want to challenge you on well, what, what are some of the solutions. But for, but for both of you, like, what, what is, how, do, how does a financial center like London practically um, you know, become part of the solution. We've identified some pieces of the puzzle that need to come together here. We need capital flows from the global north to the global south. We need more private investment. We need bankable projects. Give us a sense, I mean, that's all you know, kind of almost theoretical. <laughs> what are the nuts and bolts of some of that? Uh, is that something you can speak to? And then, and, and Diane, you know, similar, a question to you, like, how do you fit into this picture? How do you connect the dots on some of these issues? Okay, so from my point of view, let me just say, first of all, the teaching on carbon credits is great, because <laughs> I'm struggling as well, so, so thanks for that. That was really helpful. Um, look, I think that the best thing that uh, international financial centres like the City of London can do is to ensure that we have economic policies where we have good regulation, because I think that's important to the growth of our economy. Uh, and we have the, the opportunity then to make sure as well that we, we have good, strong economic domestic policies, that we ensure that we can finance our growth businesses, which in turn, as they succeed, will invest elsewhere. And that's important. And a big part of doing that, I might add at the moment, is about skills and, and having the right people to to, to actually you know, work in these growth businesses in the city of London. If I think of one of our most uh, successful bits of our financial services ecosystem in the city of London at the moment, it's around fintech, financial services. And yet we struggle to keep those businesses in this country, grow them in this country, to get the right talent into the country and to retain that talent as well. So good regulation, 
good positive domestic policy in the IFC, uh, in the International Financial Center, that stimulates our growth so that, you know, as you create, so you can share. Thank you, Chris. Diane? Thank, thank you. Um, I think, you know, as, as everyone says, we, we want to be part of the solution as opposed to just talking about things. And um, uh, maybe you followed that uh, KIFC, which is the Kigali International Financial Center, recently launched a roadmap for sustainable finance. And this is aimed at doing two things. First is uh, making finance sustainable. <clears throat> so how do you do that? If you ask me as a banker, I'll know my uh, credit risk, my liquidity risk on fingertips. I know everything about credit risk and liquidity risk. But I don't know about my climate risk. So what we want to do uh, in that framework is to make sure that uh, bankers, uh, players in the financial industry, understand the transition and start integrating climate risk in uh, you know, decision making every day. So that's one. So what KIFC also wants to do is scaling um, uh, access to sustainable financing. And this is by providing thought leadership in designing the right product structure that are relevant for part of the, of, of the world, which is uh, the, the East Africa region mainly and the African continent in general. And looking in particular at agriculture, because I, as I said, agriculture, you know, our food systems are, rely on rain. And uh, if there's no rain, there's no food. So we really need to tackle agriculture finance, but also uh, resilience agriculture finance. So, so that's what we want to do, you know, being part of, of the solution, uh, integrating climate risk in our decision making, but also scaling finance from the private sector. So what I do as a banker is, uh, first of all, understanding you know, what uh, is uh, sustainable finance. When I talk to my clients and I have projects, can be infrastructure, energy, water, etc., I always want them to integrate uh, the, the finance risk uh, issue because this is quite important. And what I want now is to be able to access funding that is affordable, well-priced, for me to be able to pass on these, uh, these um, uh, advantages or these benefits to my clients. So I think that's what we need to do. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that being in, here in London and talking to everyone oh. will be, you know, getting to solutions. Oh, I, 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 was going to, I was actually going to pick up on that because um, I imagine that you, you spend a lot of time and energy trying to convince international capital to come down to Rwanda. Um, if I can just, you know, put you on the spot slightly and ask you, what are some of the most common excuses you get or reasons you get why international capital is weary of Rwanda or Africa or developing countries in general? So I, th I think today, when you look at the, the financial space today with the ris rising rates, it's easy to find excuses as to why you know, this is not a priori priority for, for all these uh, global providers of capital. So, so that's one. And, and what I tell them is that how about, you know, we have lines of credit with uh, large DFIs, uh, European Investment Bank, and, and you name it. And, and my solution to them is why don't you just turn the current line into, you know, the sustainable finance line. So I think it's easy. And I think it's, uh, I mean, we've, we've talked, talked about, we've talked about the, the sense of urgency. We need to see that actually converting the current financing that is coming to the continent into sustainable finance. And <clears throat> products are there, some structures are there, just you know, making uh, the effort to convert these lines. And I think we'll be you know, getting closer to the solution. Thank you. Diana, uh, DFIs are kind of in the midst of all this. Um, there's obviously a huge amount that needs to be done. Um, when I look at the, the current global outlook and the global financial context, um, I worry that far from people becoming more willing to put uh, money into sustainable investments in the global south, we might be seeing a flight to safety here. And there's a concern about capital flight on the back of rising interest rates. Um, in that context, do DFIs kind of have an important role to play here to at the very least keep the torch running? And um, on the topic of solutions, um, there's a lot to be done, but what would you point to as some of the things that are working and areas in which you would say, well, you know, if, we, if we do X, Y, and Z, then we can start to make a dent here? So, um, I mean, to your first question, I obviously think DFIs have a significant role to play. Um, they play a very unusual role in investing in private sector finance. 
and projects that we believe will be successful and will be profitable, but investing in them often at a stage or, or a point in transition where others are wary to invest or where they need uh, a, a, a kind of boost in that. And actually the ability of DFIs to mobilize private sector finance I believe will be critical, I and mean, we absolutely believe will be critical to investment, not just in climate finance, but more broadly in some of the markets you're worried about. Um, in terms of what's going well, I, I think you're seeing a, um, a change in the levels of transparency around the investments, and I mean that in, in every sense of the word, but if you take um, the work that India did on making climate finance bidding much more transparent, online and structured, that enabled the II to create a platform called IANA, which is now the fifth largest renewable platform uh, in India, and to bring in other investors. We now have global investors like BP Light Source involved in that, but we were able to start that because of the increased transparency. Um, I think the next area is, and it's hard to be sure how the last few weeks have affected things, but I think you are seeing much stronger investor confidence um, in renewable projects in particular uh, around the world. Um, it was interesting to hear about Gabon. We've recently in invested in a, a thing called the Africa Forestry Impact Platform, um, which has brought in a series of established managers uh, to increase uh, forestry, particularly natural forestry, across uh, the continent. Um, and we're hoping to bring in $500 million of investment over the next three years. So I think you are starting to see uh, much clearer paths for investors to invest in these types of projects um, around the world. I think one area where we are making headway but still have to improve is around this concept of just transition uh, and what projects really do and don't qualify. Um, one of the things we've tried to do is we're a founding member of the Adaptation and Resilience uh, Investors Collaborative. Uh, and we put together an early publication called The Practitioner's Guide to Transition Finance in Africa because we're seeing a lot of investors uncertain as to whether, you know, are projects properly Paris aligned? Can they invest in them because they're still emissive? But it really is critical that we continue to invest in industries that are emissive, uh, particularly uh, in the continent. Um, the issue is to work on decarbonizing those industries and working collaboratively to improve them, not just saying, okay, you can only invest in things that are completely non-emissive at this stage. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, James, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, um, on COP27 and the outcome. Do you, think, do you feel like it's kind of moved things forward in the way that it needs to? Uh, a lot has been said about the loss and damage fund. Does that uh, get your hopes up? Does that get you excited? Um, what's, your, what's your sort of take on how, to what extent COP27 has helped to put more of a focus on what's happening in the global south? Because it's, it, it was sort of widely called Africa's COP and an opportunity to kind of shift the, the, the narrative and discussion a little bit. Has it succeeded? And um, is there cause for excitement or optimism around that? I think... Um Mixed, mixed outcomes for, for various participants, um, you know, some disappointment, some success, and as you mentioned, the, with the loss and damage component, um, you know, that, that was very much in the balance and somehow the lang language got pushed through. Um, I think for Vanuatu, it was, it was pretty successful in terms of um, promoting our agenda, which remains the priority of which is, is, uh, is what the work we're doing at the UN General Assembly. Um, I, think, um, I think the can was kicked down the road uh, a bit further to, to a certain extent. Um, and maybe now, and as far as Vanuatu is concerned, you know, we're looking forward already to Dubai and COP, COP28 and see you know, how, how are we going to leverage what we achieved at, uh, COP27. I think we, we coalesced a good amount of support for, for our ICJ initiative um, and um, you know, I would just take a moment to, to, to ask people if, if they're, they're not familiar with, with this uh, initiative at the UN. It, it's so impactful for all Commonwealth countries um, so I would urge you to, to bring yourselves up to speed um, even take a look at our website vanuatuicj.com um, read the draft resolution that's just been released by 
by Vanuatu, which will go to vote in early 2023 at the UN General Assembly. Um, so certainly there's, there's momentum there um, in, in terms of the, uh, what, what, what we're seeking to achieve. Um, and of course, it, it, COP27, you know, it, it keeps um, everything in, 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 in the public view, public domain. Um, and I just think that there is this um, increasingly growing awareness of, of um, the whole arena of climate change. Even I'm relatively recent to this whole uh, climate uh, change agenda. And I, I was mentioning to somebody earlier on, you know, my light bulb moment was, was really attending an economist uh, sustainability conference a few months ago. Uh, I went there and, and it was full of multinationals all parading their ESG credentials and their sustainability projects. Um, but everybody was very, very eager there. Um, and I thought, wow, this is something that Vanuatu really should be uh, more a part of. Um, and you know, it goes the same for, for all, all, all the countries represented here. Um, it's about proactivity and engagement. There, there is appetite in the private sector, um, and, but we, it's up to us to go after that. Um, and so COP27, just going back to that, it got a lot of coverage in the press. So that general awareness um, aspect is good. Um, and like I said, you know, we, we now already have to try and look forward to what we can achieve at COP28. And you know, the UAE and Dubai, they're very good at doing these kinds of um, events and initiatives, um, and they'll want to be the best, the first, the fastest, the, the strongest. Uh, so you can expect they will want um, visible, demonstrable results from, from that, um, and we'll be only too happy to help them do it. There's a, I think, what, something that you're pointing to, which is quite important, is it's, it's, it's essential to distinguish between the sort of front-end government to government uh, activity that takes place at COP and the, the kind of the much broader picture that is emerging behind the scenes in terms of the um, other stakeholders that are increasingly becoming part of the, the conversation. This is my understanding that that doesn't necessarily make the headlines. You know, we all want to talk about, oh, you know, has it failed or has it succeeded? But of course, there are thousands of people that come together um, at, these, uh, at these convenings, and it's not just the government-to-government -government negotiations. It's important to, to keep track of that uh, bigger picture. Energy, back to energy, that um, has been identified as a potential growth area in terms of investment, renewables in particular. Um, I'd like to throw this at, um, at the panel in general in terms of opportunities and where, you know, where are some of the promising sectors or opportunities where even, even if you are facing global headwinds, you can say, well, here the momentum is heading in the right direction. Sounds like renewable energy is one of those. Um, are there other areas that you would point to? Um, are there sort of sectors that you might point to? Or perhaps you'd like to elaborate a little bit more on the energy space and renewables. Any takers? Go, go. Okay. Um, on the energy transition, a few things. Um, first one is every country has to play to its own forces. We don't have all the same resources. For instance, Gabon, uh, we have a tremendous um, capacity in terms of hydroelectricity. So today we have an energy mix of 50-50, uh, 50% of our energy mix coming from fossil fuel, 50% coming from renewable energy. We have an objective to reach 80% of our energy mix coming from uh, renewable, mainly hydroelectricity, and 20% coming from natural gas. That being said, uh, I really believe that uh, we also have to be honest and pragmatic when we talk about energy transition in the sense that uh, gas definitely has to be taken as uh, an energy, uh, a source of energy transition for other countries. Maybe not necessarily for Gabon, but when we look globally on the continent in terms of solidarity. And um, today we're sitting in a country that has not finalized its transition. So uh, it might not be really reasonable to expect African countries to live for it. So uh, that's a point I really think it's important and I really wanted to make here on the energy opportunity, energy transition. Just like to yes. add to that, I do think that renewables are seeing 
a really strong boost, not just from climate investment, but actually often from the very tragic events in Russia and Ukraine, I think, have really emphasized the need for renewable, but the need for local as well. And um, as I just mentioned, I mean, there's huge potential for hydro uh, across the continent, but actually often in some of the areas that have been hardest uh, to supply energy to in the past. Um, we invested in a, a company called Gridworks, which builds um, small-scale electricity transmission grids and has been working in the northern DRC uh, to set up a hydropower project there and power three of the northern cities, which is something that I think wouldn't have been possible just a few years ago. So I think there's an there's a increasingly strong alignment between the global climate agenda, the importance of renewals as part of a, a, an energy process, but also um, the value and need for uh, locally sustainable uh, energy. So I think that, that is an important driver going forward. Do you have any thoughts on gas as a transition fuel? Is that part of the complexity of figuring out, well, what, what is the just transition and what's in and what's out? Absolutely. And, you know, we see, uh, we see sort of strong pushback even from the IDC uh, in Parliament in the UK that we shouldn't be investing in gas. Uh, but we have recently invested in a project in Mozambique, uh, which is a transition project. It uses gas for the next few years, but will become a renewable project after that. Uh, and I think this is the point around just transition. It's very easy for developed economies with large-scale uh, energy sufficiency and with large-scale manufacturing to say everything that's a future investment must be 100% renewable or 100% green. Actually, what is meaningful uh, in most emerging economies is first and foremost the ability to generate that power, but then to do that in a way which can transition uh, to renewable or can transition to environmentally friendly options. And I think that's what I mean by the, it, that just transition is absolutely critical. And so getting global agreement on how to invest and what the criteria are around those transition fuels uh, is very important. And I think gas is, is a key one. I mean, coal is obviously much more challenging, um, but gas as a transition, I think, clearly has value in some parts of the world. There. Yeah, I think investors in every sector, including energy, that they respond to incentives. And uh, we need, uh, in, in our region, for instance, uh, energy pro is produced by small IPPs, independent power producers. And these typically produce a megawatt, two, three megawatts. But how do we give these people access to affordable uh, finance? Because this is the only way. Otherwise, the person who is importing coal or using coal is, is going to you know, be more successful. Because if the price of finance, the cost of finance is the same, uh, you know, there's no way you can finance the transition. So what we need to do is to make sure the small IPPs in, on the continent have access to uh, um, affordable finance. I think that's the only way to, to uh, finance the transition. And this means uh, large banks like us have to be able to access uh, affordable finance in you know, global capital markets so, uh, so that these, our clients will also get access to this funding. So it's the only way, in my view, uh, because energy is produced by uh, the private sector, is really to create the right incentives for these people to be able to pr produce renewable energy. You, you just used the word, you know, capital needs incentives. And um, you know, for those of you who are familiar with, with Africa, you, one of the a common theme that you will hear is that the continent suffers from a risk premium, a uh, risk perception premium, that uh, risk, whether justified or not, is kind of axiomatically assumed to be higher in Africa, and as such, it's a more, more dangerous place to do business. But uh, in many ways, it's, it's nothing personal, right? Um, and is, if you put the right conditions in place, capital, capital will go. I mean, as, you know, they're not as uh, global capital isn't hesitant about going to China, it hasn't been for quite a while, uh, and, and, and many other, you know, uh, emerging parts of, uh, of the world. Um, Diane, if I, if I could start with you on this, what are those building blocks? What are those incentives to, you know, to kind of basically just tick the boxes? Because my sense is if you can tick the boxes, you know, there will always, there will always be some people who just like, I'm not doing Africa, right? But uh, I'm sure there's quite a broad spectrum of people who would quite happily put capital into uh, a, a part of the world like Africa if the conditions are met. Um, 
what are some of those and what are some of the important ones that are missing? So, you know, I, I'll give you my perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a global provider of, of capital does not need to reach the small IPP in Rwanda. Uh, I think he or she can reach that small IPP through me. And I can absorb that risk because I understand the risk of doing business in Rwanda. Maybe, you know, someone who's based in London doesn't. But we are here to serve as intermediaries. You know, and that's, that's what we do. We can get this global capital. You know, we happen to be listed in Rwanda, in Nairobi. And we want to be intermediaries. Uh, and I, I believe you know, we, have, we are ESG compliant. I think it wouldn't be a problem. <clears throat> but <clears throat> thinking that uh, someone based in London will have access to an energy producer <clears throat> in the southern province of Rwanda, I think it's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. But let's make good use of intermediaries because you know, we can talk the same language and we are able to get the, the, the right outcomes and the right impact. What about scale and regional markets? Is, that's a common barrier that you run into, is people will say, I'd happily invest in Africa, but many countries on their own are just not big enough. And, and, and uh, James, maybe from the Vanuatu perspective, that might be a common issue that you run up against. Now, in the African context, the answer is obvious, regional integration. We know about the AFCFTA. Um, it is getting, I mean, we, we kind of got to stop beating around the bush on this, right? Like this integration process kind of has to happen. And my sense is that that would go some way to increasing the level of appetite and the the, level, the volume of capital that you can increase. Are you uh, confident that the, the regional integration bit is starting to come together, maybe Akim and, and Diane? Um, to, on the integration bit, it's taking time, but uh, I believe we're really getting there. And that will be a real um, unblocker or unlocker in terms of uh, capital flow to, to the continent. But quickly to touch uh, upon the point that you mentioned earlier, there's, the real the, the, the issue of um, risk perception has to do with uh, asymmetry of information, and I think they had mentioned by saying that uh, the, the bank can uh, can act as an intermediary, and at the same time, when you take um, an institution such as the one I have the privilege to lead, which is a sovereign wealth fund, that's also uh, some type of vehicles that can bring those natural edge to the investors, because now when an investor comes to Gabon, he knows that he can, there's an institution, uh, the sovereign wealth fund is there, and if we team up together, if we co-invest, we bring our understanding of the regulatory framework, our, our contacts, our, our understanding of um, uh, the environment to the transaction. And at the same time, we do invest on the project, so we have skin in the game, and we have total alignment in terms of interest. And we've seen for the past seven years that the fund has been running, we've seen that also as a, an unlocker of um, capital flow to the country. Look, I, I believe there are reasons to be optimistic. I think integration is happening. Uh, it should have happened long ago, but you know, we see good progress now. And, and then again, uh, I see African players being in a better position to benefit from this integration. Uh, you know, when I talk about Rwanda, my main competitors are African regional banks. You know, Equity Bank, I think uh, uh, James Mwangi will probably be here later today, Ecobank. So, so we have regional players that are established, that are, understand not only global capital markets, but also individual local uh, markets and you know, can take risks in these uh, countries. So let, let's make use of, of these people because they've done this for a while. They know how to you know, intermediate between global capital markets and, 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 and individual countries. So I, I think, again, uh, there are ways to do things. Uh, we just need to you know, get at it. Chris, to kind of turn this, uh, look at the other side of this coin. Um, you know, there is what can be done on the ground in a, in a part of the world like Africa to incentivize capital. Well, what can you do to incentivize capital? There was a comment made uh, during the opening ceremony by John Glenn around institutional inertia in the city of London. Is that part of the problem? Yeah, I've got to be honest. I think there probably is, is, is some of that. I mean, if I go back, and I was in Sharm el Sheikh as well for, for COP27, and the thing that really, really hit me was that we've now got to get to a point of delivery. You know, that, that we've been, talk is cheap, 
if I can put it that way. Lots of commitments were made at GFANS, lots of money was promised, but we actually have to get into a period of delivery. And I think this theme, and we've heard it talked about on the panel today, of a just transition is incredibly important. And it's, it's, it, you, you picked up at the start, um, this isn't charity either, this is, this is sound business propositions. And that's what we've got to persuade the city and financial institutions of, that this isn't a charitable endeavor. But when I was in Sharma Sheikh, I, I remember uh, Ashok Sharma, who is president of COP26, saying 1.5 is still alive but it's on life support. And actually, I thought that's quite a serious statement when you actually unpick it and realize that the speed at which we are moving is still way too slow. The monies which have been promised are taking too long to deliver. And if we're really gonna to get to 2050, we've gotta make sure that COPs are more than just thousands of people gathering and all agreeing that we've got a major challenge to the planet. It's, it's what we do, it's how we solve it, it's how we get that money, not just from the City of London, but from other international financial centres out there and actually working. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Diana, would you like to, to comment on anything that's been raised? I think the only thing I'd say is you've got to work on all parts of the chain. So I think the government and public sector has to work on the enabling environment and the regulatory environment. And I think Rwanda and Gabon have done a, a terrific job on that. Um, I think there is a big role for the financial services industry in structuring transactions and making these uh, investable. Obviously having additional participants like sovereign wealth funds clearly helps with that. DFIs can also help in de-risking of projects, but it's having that full spectrum uh, of financing and the ability to structure it, as well as, um, as you say, being able to route finance clearly um, to the institutions that can invest most effectively. We have a, a few minutes left, and um, what I'd like to, to look at in, in, in the time that we do have is to what the impact of the state of the global economy on the prospect for sustainable and green investment and financing is. Um, you know, it's a question of if, not when, we're heading into a recession, I think. It's a question of how bad it will be, <laughs> um, and that's up for debate, but, uh, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, does, do you see that posing a meaningful risk to the, um, the willingness and the amount of capital that is available and dedicated to sustainable investing. So, um, you're just trolling the news in recent weeks, I've, I've come across a few headlines around an anti-ESG backlash and divestment from uh, ESG funds, etc. Is that a knee-jerk reaction? Um, are we looking at just kind of, you know, a bit of market, pa market panic? Or could we be looking at a more substantive pullback from the world of sustainable financing and green financing. Uh, Chris, you're nodding. Um, well, would you like to kick us off on that? Yeah, look, I, I hope it's the former of what you said. I hope it's a knee-jerk reaction and not something more fundamental. Look, there's no doubt that when you move into recession, when the, and this isn't just a problem for the United Kingdom. You know, I was in Washington a couple of weeks ago, same problems there, higher inflation, higher interest rates, Europe the same. This is, this is something now that part of which has been driven by the Russian-Ukraine war, energy prices, cost of living. These are all common things, themes. They make it more difficult for ESG. Let's not pretend they don't. And there's always a temptation for government as well, or governments, to take their foot off the accelerator a bit, to try to give businesses in particular a bit more breathing space because of the cost of hitting net zero uh, at a time when your business is being really challenged. I think this is just the time when we've got to press the foot harder down on the accelerator, actually, and make sure that we continue that, that delivery. Because if you look at the history of climate change, it's been very stop-start. It's been very promises one day, then it, then it drifts, then we come back and we talk about it again. You know, time is running out, and we really have to remember that. So just allow me to give one quick plug, if I may, for in May next year, we will host in this room, the Lord Mayor and I, our Net Zero Delivery Summit. We did this for last year, and we had John Kerry, and we had Mark Carney here, 
um, and the theme will be a just transition. And the reason why we're having it in May is it's halfway between both COPs. So actually it gets people focused on, well, we talked a lot about X, Y, and Z in Sharm el Sheikh. We've got Dubai coming up. Where are we six months you know, before and after? So I do hope as many people as possible will take that opportunity to come to the Net Zero Delivery Summit here because it will focus minds again on driving home the delivery. So Chris says we need to double down. Any, any other thoughts? Anyone want to echo that, James? Uh, all I can say is that if that finance pool or availability shrinks, then people like me just have to work faster, harder, smarter to go after it. It'll still be there, um, but we need to be just ever more compelling in the way that we approach and, and um, ask for the finance. I, mean, I think it's a huge risk, but I don't think we can afford to let that transpire. I mean, <laughs> as you say, this is the point at which you cannot sacrifice the long term for the short term. It requires sustained, serious focus. But if we continue to have an evolve a function carbon credit market, if we continue to have focus on this, uh, I think it's entirely possible uh, to continue achieving. But we have to be aware that you're right. It's a concern. People look at short term political motives. I think every crisis provides an opportunity to rethink and, and redesign the rules of the game. I think we've seen that uh, you know, after the previous uh, financial crisis. And this one is probably different because it's a COVID crisis uh, coming with uh, the inflation crisis. So, so the, the solutions cannot be short term. Uh, and, and it will require obviously a lot of uh, political will. Uh, but I believe after the past two years, we've seen how the world is interconnected. No one can think of, of you know, shortcuts. I think we really need to look long term and, and to scale um, uh, sustainable finance. Akim, any final thoughts? Um, I think it has been said, really. Uh, let's just hope that it's just uh, circumstantial and that um, people will put their foot on the gas again real quick because there's a sense of, of emergency. Yeah, I, um, I would tend to agree. Um, I like the message of doubling down, and we can't afford for this to be the case. And we just got to work that much harder if, if, if that is the reaction. Um, the, the, I think the, I like the quote by Alok Sharma, that 1.5 is still there, but it's on life support. I think he might be understating the severity of the problem. It's, it's almost, it's kind of scary I, I, to me that given what's at stake, and the stake simply could not be higher than when you consider what climate change is doing and will do to the planet if left unchecked. And um, all I can say is let's hope that that is enough to focus the mind because if that doesn't focus the collective mind of humanity to get its act together and start doing rather than just saying, then I fear nothing will. So we are not lacking in incentives to make this happen. Um, and, uh, you know, fingers crossed for the summit in May for COP28 next year. And uh, keep up the good work to everyone. Please join me in thanking the panel for the discussion. Good news. We now have a 15-minute break. You can stretch your legs. You've been very patient. Thank you so much. Get some coffee. Get a snack. Back here in 15 minutes for the FinTech panel. You will not want to miss that one. Thank you.